came through. It echoes. <laughs> and it goes before you. Can't, 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 be, can't be contained. Goes up, goes back, goes around, goes wherever, wherever that. It's an echo. So as you walk through that, because sometimes our breakthrough, <laughs> I know this personally, sometimes our breakthrough is really, really long. It's long and it's tiring to get to the other side. But I can see that so clearly as we sing and we praise and we lift our anthem and we lift our word to the Lord. That it echoes and it goes before you, whatever you cannot see, whatever you cannot see, your praise reaches it before you ever get there. Before you ever get there. Yes, come on, come on. So think about that. Where you're standing at, where you're praising, it's gonna reach wherever you're going. Let us continue forward in our breakthrough and let us continue to praise and let us continue to let that echo, let our praise echo. God, let our praise echo. Let it echo, let it echo, let it echo wherever we go, God. Let it go before us and behind us, God, wherever around, up, wherever it needs to go, God. Let it be heard. Let it be heard in every situation, every circumstance, whatever it is, God. And let us walk in that. Let us walk in that. So we will continue to praise you. We continue to praise you, God. So let it be an echo, an echo of praise. Let our lives be an echo of praise just for you. Just for you. Just for you.
Had a, I had a couple words that were <clears throat> just text to me. Um, I don't want to just read them this time. I want them to come and share those. So, Sherry, can you and uh, Amanda, are you back there, Amanda? Can you come come and uh, just begin to release what you what you've seen? Um, let's let Amanda go first. Um, during worship, I saw. A giant and the giant was standing in front of someone and as my vision panned out I saw that there was a line of identical giants behind the first one um, it was like that they were waiting in line to confront this person when it was their turn but the first giant fell backwards and like dominoes every single giant fell every single giant not one was left standing I asked the Lord, I said, what caused this giant to fall? And he clearly and strongly said, authority. When you stand in your authority over all things, your enemies have to fall. They may have power, but they have no authority whatsoever. Jesus was given all authority, and he said, all authority I have given unto you. When you realize all authority is yours, and you exercise that authority, there's not a single giant that can stand. They will all fall. All authority has been given unto you. Yeah, during the last portion of worship, I just, I heard that scripture, just believe out of Mark 9, 23, it says, Jesus said, if you can believe all things are possible, or no, it says, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes. I know that sounds simple, but I felt like it is, it's not just for me, but it's for everybody in this room that is just the belief in that he is able to do above and beyond what we think or feel. And I receive that for myself. And I actually... I actually got some something for somebody in this room. I feel like I know who it is, but it could be for more than one person. Always, if you hear something, even if it's not directly directed towards you, if it hits your spirit, then take it because it's the Word of God, so it's living and breathing. But I heard, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I felt like there's hopefully all of us in here that we're hungering and we're thirsting I, I think that's for everybody here but I think there's a specific situation for somebody in this room that is really really searching and really really travailing in some things after God and you're so hungry you're just so desperate you will do just about anything to hear to encounter to have more of 
Well, you have, if you have Jesus in you, you have all that you're ever going to have, but you will have greater revelation of who he is. I take that for myself, actually. Greater revelation of his love and who he is inside of me. But I felt like, I'm going to read this again. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I do believe someone in here is going to be filled in a greater capacity with the revelation of Jesus. Hey, is uh, I saw Josh Morris. Hey, can you come up here? Hey, can you share what you saw last week? Do you do you remember it? Can you recall it? Good enough. He shared this with me after service last week, and I thought about it. So it's funny that you would ask me to come do that because I'm sitting here. And, you know, there's some things that dropped in over service during worship, and I said, "Well, Lord, if you ask me to come up, then I'll." I'll come up. So apparently that's what he wants to talk about. So there's something interesting last uh, last week when worship was happening. I saw uh, something that, that you guys had done like the week prior in worship and prayer, what you were doing here. And I saw a man standing uh, up front and and he was waving his hand in the air like this. And as he was doing this, there was a fire above him. And he took the fire and he brought it down and he placed it on the ground. And I saw the vats, like the wells that are in this house. But I saw in the very middle a fire that was placed in the middle of of those things. So whatever you guys were doing, be encouraged because it was doing something. And then uh, a couple of things that happened during worship uh, and, I, and I did hear the Lord say this very, very clearly. Father is looking for those to give him permission and then come into agreement. Like he wants you to give him permission to do things in your life. He already can do it without your permission. But something about you inviting him into your space, saying, God, I need you. You have full permission to do this. And then coming into agreement with what it is he's doing. The other thing that I saw, remember that, because that's important. It's very important. Don't glaze over that and just think it's a small thing. Because he knows what you have need of, but why would he ask you to pray after he knows what you have need of? He's looking for permission. He's also looking for agreement. Do you agree with what he's doing? The amen is the agreement. So be it. Let it happen. The other thing is this, is there's going to be There's going to be a separation between Egypt and Goshen. Now, just let me just real quick. When when Abraham brought the sons and they all came and then Joseph gave them the land and Pharaoh gave them the land, he gave them Goshen, right? Goshen being a place of peace. Goshen being a place of green. But it also meant there was a... When the plagues came, when judgment came to Egypt, there was a difference between where the people of God were and where the rest of the world was. So there's a, there's a separation coming from those who really legitimately know who Abba is. And they're walking with him. There's about to be a, a wealth. And there's about to be a distinguishing between who those people are in the earth and the rest of everyone else. Now, if that puffs you up, that's not what's intended. There's coming something in the earth that God is going to distinguish between those who are really his. That doesn't put you in some elite club either. It just simply means he's about to do what he did with Israel way back in the beginning. I'm going to set you as a nation above nations so that they will all become jealous and ask why. Why do you have that? Good stuff. Awesome stuff. Hey, we're going to, um, thanks worship team. Awesome job. That's, yeah. Yeah, just good deal. Oh, 
or where if that gets to be too much back there you can adjust that on his channel but I like it it'll work um, so recapping some of this we had giants falling like dominoes through authority one giant lined up fell and all the other giants that were identical fell in 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 order behind that like dominoes and this was authority all authority of heaven and earth has been given to jesus and then you go in his authority okay then sherry was believing anything you ask in his name and it'll be accomplished I don't know if she said it exactly like that, but just sharing that. And then, and then for somebody in the room, blessed are them that hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be satisfied. And, um, and then Josh Morris is sharing what he saw last week with the fire and the, and the wells uh, that's coming even from a, a word that we had a couple years ago, a little over two years ago. There are seven wells of revival here. And, uh, and, and he was speaking even somewhat, somewhat even into that and seeing some of that. He didn't see them necessarily. He saw them as, as vats, as like water pots. Um, but yes. Um, and then talking about uh, going into that, and he was talking about, he said it some, several things in there, but coming into agreement, coming into agreement with... Uh, with some things, and he, when he was using that, it was, it was and, it, and it's going to bring us into a moment of being sought out. This is, this is something that, uh, that happened in the day of Solomon, where kings around the world came to watch him go up the steps and sat down. Kings around the world and other, other places around the world would seek out the wisdom of Solomon that would decide matters. And so it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a really, really cool things that are, that are going forth. Um, I'm going in several places. I've, I, I, I feel like I, I was a little back and forth on some things here. And, um, in, in the words that have went forth, I feel like, I feel like that, Hey, these, th- there's some, there's some confirmation here. And um, I feel like I have another piece to some things that we've been releasing on don't fear what's been finished. Don't fear what's been finished. And I want to I touch on some of these things that have been released even today um, with, with the authority, believing, uh, agreement, and, and, and those things. So I want to I just release some things here. And so thanks so much for being here today. And I believe uh, the, the Lord's, yes, um, I need to speak to somebody in here uh, that's been, you, you're going through like a stormy moment. Um, I was seeing this, the Lord, the Holy Spirit was reminding me of that. Uh, I was seeing this during the, during the worship, and um, he, he was showing me a picture of a, um, a, a palm tree. And, uh, and that palm tree, palm trees are um, very unique because they're, you come here in Arkansas and you get straight line winds and, and you'll see trees being just, they just fall over because they're not designed, they're not designed to withstand really strong winds, but palm trees are not that way. Palm trees can bend over and touch the ground and pop back up because they're native to coastlines where hurricanes come in and hurricanes generally i'm not saying that there's never can be a palm tree that fell over and didn't get but but palm trees are designed to withstand really strong storms and really strong winds where they can bend over touch the ground and when the storm passes they can pop back up like they were it's so it's really unique and the and the father was he was showing me a picture of a of i was seeing like a storm a real strong storm and i just felt like somebody was in a in the middle of a storm or maybe not in the middle of a storm maybe and i don't want to i'm not i'm not a broker of fear but maybe there was a storm coming or you're in a storm or you just came from a storm i don't really know where it is in the timeline but i saw a storm and i saw i saw you standing like a palm tree and he's saying that you're going to withstand this thing. And I just want to encourage somebody in here today that whatever you got going on, it's not the end. It's not the end of something. 
It's not the thing that's going to cause you to be done in. It's not the thing that's going to cause you to be um, uprooted and and just just worthless or something like that. It's going to be something that you're going to withstand. You're going to go through it, but you're going to withstand it, and you're going to come out on the other side. Are you with me? You're going to come out on the other side, and you will be fruitful. Hear the Lord saying, "You will be fruitful." And I saw the palm tree, and it, and he was he was talking to me about the palm tree, and then he was the, then, then I started going in Scripture to this word of oaks of righteousness where they're planted by streams of living water. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be planted like oaks of righteousness. And, and I saw, and he began to just transform that during stormy times, you transform like a palm tree to withstand things. But when the storm is over, you are like an oak of righteousness that can provide shade and covering for other generations and for other people. And And so I just want to encourage somebody in here that you're going to withstand this thing and you're going to have lasting fruit out of this. And this thing, this is not going to be the thing that finishes you. It's not going to be the thing that finishes you. It's going to be something that makes you stronger. Let me say it to you like this. If you don't let it make you bitter, God will use it to make you better. Can we do that? All right. So whoever that's for, maybe more than one, that's all right. But just, just, just run with that and, and see, see what the Lord is, is doing in you and just be encouraged. He sees exactly where you're at. You're not alone and you're going to withstand this thing and great fruit, generational fruit is going to come out of it. Amen. That's good whether you know it or not. And uh, so it, it, it'll be good. Um, I want to start in John 16. John 16, we might as well just go there first. 16, verse number 17. Oftentimes, read out of the Passion Translation. Uh, uh, sometimes, if you're hearing me quote, it could be out of the NASB, ESV, or King James. It just all these things just run together. And, uh, and so, um, but I love to read out of, out of the Passion. Uh, John 16, verse 17. Some of the disciples asked each other, what does he mean soon you won't see me? And a little while after that, you will see me in a new way. And what does he mean? Because I'm going to my father. So they kept on repeating. What's the meaning of a little while? We have no clue what he's talking about. Jesus knew what they were thinking. And it was obvious they were anxious to ask him what he had meant. So he spoke up and said, let me make it quite clear. You will weep and be overcome with grief over what happens to me. The unbelieving world will be happy while you'll be filled with sorrow. But know this, your sadness will turn into joy when you see me again. Just like a woman giving birth, giving birth experiences intense labor pains in delivering her baby, yet after the child is born, she quickly forgets what she went through because of the overwhelming joy of knowing that a new baby has been born into the world. So will you also pass through a time of intense sorrow when I'm taken from you, but you will see me again, and then your hearts will burst with joy with no one being able to take it from you. For here is eternal truth. When that time comes, you won't need to ask me for anything, but instead you'll go directly to the Father and ask for anything you desire and he will give it to you because of your relationship with me. Watch it now. Until now, you've not been bold enough to ask the Father for a single thing in my name, but now you can ask and keep on asking him. You have, you, and, and you can be sure that you'll receive what you ask for and your joy will have no limits. Your joy will have no limits. I've spoken to you using figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer teach you with veiled speech, but I will teach you about the Father with your eyes unveiled, and I will not need to ask the Father on your behalf, for you'll ask him directly because of your new relationship with me. For the Father tenderly loves you because you love me and believe that I've come from God. I came, to, I came to you sent from the Father's presence and I entered into the created world and now I will leave this world and return to my Father's side. All right? This is good. Good stuff. 
Let, uh, let's let's keep going. Let's just grab the last four, and and of this of this stanza here. His disciples said, at least you're speaking to us clearly and not using veiled speech and metaphors. And now we understand that you know everything there is to know and we don't need to question you further and everything you've taught us convinces us that you came directly from God. Jesus replied, now you finally believe in me and the time has come when you will be scattered and each of you will go your own way, leaving me alone, yet I'm never alone. For the Father is always with me and everything I've taught you is so that you so that the peace which is in me will be in you and will give you great confidence as you rest in me for in this unbelieving world you will experience trouble and sorrows but you must be courageous for I have conquered the world amen all right I want to I need to go like a hundred other places here but I need to deal with I need to deal with some things right here in the in the midst of this okay He's saying, and, and, and catching this, he said, Let me, I'm going to make some things really clear for you, okay? You're about to weep and be in great sorrow over what's going to happen to me. What's he talking about? He's talking about his crucifixion. You're going to weep and be in great sorrow over what's happening to me. And the world is going to be, and the world is going to be happy. They're going to be, they're they're going to be glad for what they've been able to seemingly do to me. And you're going to be in great sorrow. And then he said, "But your sadness won't last long." He's saying your sadness won't last. Your sadness won't last. But joy is going to be overwhelming you when you see me again. When are you going to see me again? After three days, he's going to raise from the dead. He appears to them no less, no less, maybe more, but no less than 11 times from the cross to Pentecost, Jesus is appearing to the disciples. Okay? Tracking with me, all right? And so, so he said, you're going to see me again and it's going to bring great joy. And this joy, nobody's going to be able to take this joy from you because you've seen me. Nothing can, nothing can rob you from the resurrection life that you're about to experience in me. This is what he's telling them. It's good news. Why? Because his crucifixion is my crucifixion. His burial is my burial. His resurrection is my resurrection. Also, his ascension is my ascension. And then he says, just like a woman giving birth. Now, if you if you go back and listen to the previous uh, uh, previous four four weeks here, maybe six, whatever it is, uh, and 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 releasing this to you, um, that don't fear what's been finished. We we discovered that on the cross from the side, the bride was born. He said, it is finished, my bride. He's saying this, but and and. They pierced his side. They did not break his bones, which fulfilled the scripture that no bones would be broken. But but they pierced his side because because they and when they pierced his side, water and blood came out of his side. All right, and and I understand what we we pointed this out. Water is a symbolism of the word blood. Blood obviously the the blood of Jesus and 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 it is covering you. There's something there that is happening, and I'm not telling you, but there's an even deeper insight than that. Water and blood is something that happens. Water and blood happen when when birth happens. First, there's water, then there's blood, and there's something that's being birthed. A baby is being born. Out of the first Adam, out of the first Adam, the bride of the first Adam came from his side. The bride of the last Adam came from his side. He was birthing the bride on that cross and saying, it is finished, was not saying that my life is now done on earth. It was a declaration. It is finished is just as much a declaration of it has begun meaning that the kingdom is now come in such form and manner that I am the firstborn among many brethren and I have conformed all of you to become into the image of who that I am. We're we're going there in just a minute, all right? But in John 16, going through this, in John 16, he says, he says it like this, verse 23, for here's an eternal truth. When, the t- when that time comes, when what time? When you begin, your weeping turns to joy and you see me again. When that time comes, you won't need to ask me for anything, but instead you're going to go directly to the Father and ask him for anything you desire and he's going to give it to you because of your relationship with me. All right? You know the scripture, he'll give you the desires of your heart, 
Well, it's more than that. It actually says to delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Okay? You want the desires of your heart fulfilled? Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. What's he saying here? You can ask whatever you want in my name. You can ask whatever that you want. And, 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 he, and John says this about four different times through John 14, 15, 16, um, before, right before he gets into 17. And he says this about four different times. Ask whatever you want. But he's also talking, John 15, he's talking about the connection that you have with the Father that you have with the Son is the connection, abide in me and and I will abide in you. Why? Because I'm the true vine. You stay connected to me, then you're going to be fruitful. I need you to see it. Man, it's been a long time. I don't remember this. If If I were to have up here... If I were to go outside and over there on the tree line, and uh, and and obviously I, d- I didn't do this, but if I were to go do this, and I were to and I were to uh, find find a limb on the ground, and I were to pick it up and bring it in here, and it was it's a brown limb, but at the same time I took a fresh limb off the tree. And I were to bring it in here, and I had this, I had this, I had this branch with with green shoots on it, and uh, or maybe a pine tree. We'll just use that. And I and I and I and I got and I got pine needles on it, or whatever it is. And and then and then I have this other limb that came from the same tree, and it has no pine, and it's rotted, and it's and it's it's barren, and it's just which one of these is dead. And I were to say to you, which one of these is dead? And you would look at that one's dead, has nothing on it. But the reality is they're both dead. Why are they both dead? Because they've both been severed from the source that was producing life in them. So they would both be dead. But the reality is the one with the green stuff on it just doesn't know it yet. You need to see it. Abide in me and I'll abide in you for apart from me you can do nothing but connected in me you'll do everything. Sometimes when you lose your connection, sometimes when you lose your connection, it's good for a while because you don't know yet what's truly happened. But the more you stay connected to him, the more fruit you're going to find that you're going to produce in life, and he's going to cause things to happen. So he's talking about this connection. It's not what I'm preaching about. So he's talking about this connection. It's not what I'm preaching about. But it, it's, it, it's just good thought for you to have right there. All right? So staying connected to him is going, and, he, and this is what he's talking about, and he's doing this throughout John 15, abide in me and I'll abide in you, says abide in me like, I don't know, five, six, seven times. He's talking about abiding in me, staying connected to me. Staying connected, what's he talking about? Re- staying connected to me in relationship. And if you're connected to me in relationship, we get into John 16, and he said, after this, after my death and my resurrection and your sorrow turns to joy, that you're going to be not have to ask me for anything because you'll go directly to the Father because of your relationship with me. Relationship brings you access. Are you with me? Relationship brings you access. I need, I need you to see that. I need you to see that. I got people in my life. I got, listen, I got people in my life, and um, let, let's, let's do it this way. Um, I got people in my life that they, they can speak to me certain ways because of their relationship with me. I've got spiritual fathers in my life that can speak at me in certain ways because of their relationship with me. I need you to track with me. And if they called me up and, and you know, just whatever, if they called me up and, and started, uh, started telling me a bunch of things that it wasn't great to hear, but they have the relationship with me to do so, that's one thing. But on the other hand, you let somebody that I don't know and I get on the phone with them and they start running their mouth, I'm going to shut them up quick. Because I'm not, listen, I may, I may be a son, but you ain't running over me. <laughs> Come on. I, I guess that is. Y'all straighten up your halos. I guess I don't know. Uh, just like like somebody, like I, I, it goes, somebody, somebody says some things on the phone or something like that. It goes on, it, it goes on me quick sometimes and, and maybe too quick. And I'm like, listen, I don't have time to deal with stupid. And you fit the bill. And, and I, I don't have time to deal with this right now. I'm a grown man 
And this language might have worked in your crappy marriage, but it ain't going to work here. I mean, just, just that was this prophetic insight. Uh, just like I don't even know if they were married or not. Uh, just, just, uh, uh, just some things there. But I'm not going to let that happen. Why? Because we don't have the relationship for you to talk this way. Listen, you need people in relationship in your life. You why? 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 It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Let me, man, I wasn't going here, but it'd be fun anyway. Um, there was a time in there was a time in the day of David where it came where it came the moment for for um, it was the time of year where people were to give an offering to the king. They were to give an offering to the king, and um, at that moment there was a, there was a fool. His name meant folly. His name was Nabal. And um, Nabal decided, I'm not going to give an offering to the king. And this is what he said. The, the servants of David came to collect an offering. And Nabal's response was this. Who is the son of Jesse? And he's like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. And he told the servant, and the servant said, are you sure you want me to tell the king this? Yes. He's an idiot. And he goes back to report this to the king, and David said, he said, what? And he saddles his horse and takes a, he gets his sword. He is going to kill Nabal, going to kill him. You're not going to, you're not going to talk like that. We're not having that. There came the moment of honor, and you chose to be dishonoring. And David's going to go take his life. And on his way to take his life, Abigail, Nabal's wife, finds out what he did. And I don't know how long she's been covering for this man, but she found out what he did this time. And she prepares this large, extravagant offering. And she goes out to meet David before he gets to her house. And David stops in the tracks when he's seen Abigail. It, it even says how beautiful that she was. Beautiful women tend to stop David in his tracks. And, and he stopped in his tracks, and she gives him this extravagant offering, said, don't, he's already a dead man. Don't even come to my house. And, 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 and she gives him this extravagant offering, and he's like, okay, and, he, and, he, and the offering at that moment stopped, stopped uh, destruction. I don't know if David was just going to kill Nabal or if he was going to kill the entire household. But I know he is going to take Nabal's life and it stopped that tragedy from coming to that household. And when Nabal got wind of what Abigail had done, he basically had a heart attack and laid in his tent and died in three days. David hears about it and said, well, blessed be the name of the Lord. Come on, man. You thought you were supposed to mourn everybody's death. No, some people needed to get out of the way. Um, that's not, that's not going to grow our church. I'm not, I needed to talk, talk something different. <laughs> talk something different. No, no. Uh, like, like he said, blessed be the name. Of, you don't have to take my word for it. Go read this story. It's not on your nursery wall, but it's really there. And David said, blessed be the name of the Lord. And he remembered the appearance of Abigail and he went and took that widow for his own wife. Come on. This is what happened. Her extravagant offering in that moment of honor, okay? So sometimes, and Nabal's name meant folly, he was a fool and he died a fool's death. You didn't have to. There's other people that died a fool's death in the scripture that, that even says they died a fool's death. I don't, I don't have time. I don't have time. You need somebody in your life, okay? Why am I bringing this up about Abigail? She talked to the king and she said, I know who you are. I know you're the king. And she gives him a great offering. Why is it a big deal? Because David's about to go kill some people. And she's like, you don't have to do this. He's already dead. He's already dead because of what's in his heart and what's happened. 
And I want you to see this. Why is it a big deal that you have people of relationship in your life? Because sometimes you need some people that will be so blunt with you that they can speak to the king on the inside of you when you're acting like a fool. And this is the value of Abigail in David's life. When you're about to go do something that you don't need to be doing, I want to speak to the king on the inside of you and say that honor is here. Honor is here. Nabal wouldn't listen to Abigail, and he lost his life. David turned back, and he inherited a bride. Man. All right. You need people in your life that can speak to the king on the inside of you in all situations because sometimes storms are going to come and the enemy's going to try to get you to doubt your identity and you need a spiritual father, a spiritual mother. You need somebody in your life that can get a hold of God, that has a relationship with you, that can tell you when you're acting like an idiot and you won't be offended. If you don't have that person, you better find them. You better find them. Why? Because it's a big deal. It'll save you from error. All right. I wasn't preaching on that. That was just extra. That was just extra for you. Because of your relationship with me, you can ask him whatever you want because of your connection with me. You can ask him whatever you want. Until now, you've not been bold enough to ask the Father for a single thing in my name. But now you can ask when, when you see me again, you can ask and you can keep on asking him and you can be sure that you'll receive what you ask for and your joy will have no limits. Your joy will have no limitation. So I want the desires of my heart to be fulfilled. So I need to delight myself in the Lord. I need to engage in worship. I need to engage in praise and begin to delight myself in the Lord and minister to the Lord. Not so that I can just get my wish list granted, but this is out of relationship with him. Don't worship because it's Sunday morning. Worship because you love him. Worship because you have a divine connection with the creator and you can get to engage with him in a corporate worship, but worship when you're not corporately together. And you, but why? Because you have a divine relational connection with him and it's not just so you can twist his arm. He doesn't need to join you in your anxiety about what's going on in life. You just need to trust in the connection that you already have. And out of that connection, there's desire that are going to begin to bubble up. You need, some of you have been writing off things in prayer that you thought were distractions, but God was really unveiling dis- desires. Because, because growing up, this is what I learned about prayer in, in religious society, that when you're praying and you start thinking about something that doesn't sound like prayer, that's the devil trying to distract you. And we've been accusing God of being the devil that's trying to distract us. Ask whatever you desire in prayer out of connection with me. So when I'm praying and a thought begins to come that does not seem like it's prayer, but it's something that I need to do out of, come on, it brings direction. My prayer is bringing direction to my life and he might be whispering something in prayer that I'm needing to do that's going to start a domino effect in my life by doing this action out of prayer. I begin to hear this. Out of prayer, I had an idea. Well, that seems crazy. What a distraction that is. God, I bind that. I bind that distraction. I bind that distraction. I bind that distraction because I know that's not what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be in here in prayer and be talking in tongues the whole time so that, no, no, no. Listen, listen. When your heart out of relationship with him and out of that connection and out of that prayer, your desires are there. You're you're delighting yourself in the Lord. He's wanting to uh, reveal the desires of your heart. And in his name, you can ask for these things and it'll be done. But this is what's amazing. The more that you delight yourself in him, it's not about you parking more vehicles in your driveway. It's about you delighting yourself in the Lord. And if you'll delight yourself in the Lord long enough, then you won't be concerned as much about how many vehicles you've parked in your driveway. You'll be more concerned about the 
heart of the Father becoming your heart. And when that happens, whatever you want to ask, your heart is becoming so one with him that he's unveiling his desire in you. And it's not a distraction. He's given you an invention. He's given you an idea. He's given you a business. He's given you the unction of whatever you need to do. You're in prayer and these thoughts aren't all distractions. Come on. Now, I'm not telling you that there can't be a distractive thought that comes to you in prayer. If you're in prayer and all you can think about is donuts, might be a distraction. I think about eating donuts now. That's what I'm thinking about, is eating donuts. No, no, that might be a distraction. Or don't be so, always just like, God, what are you revealing about this? Are you saying something about these donuts or what? Because I need to know. It's not maybe about me eating donuts, but maybe there's somebody because you have all of a sudden a desire to eat donuts that you found yourself at the beloved Krispy Kreme straight from heaven because the light was on and they were going to give you a free one and you went in there and you, and you went in there and then all of a sudden I went in there for a donut, but then there was somebody that I needed to minister to. And I thought it was just a distraction the whole time. Man. Now, some of you have been too distracted by donuts. But we need to make up our mind that God can speak to us however he wants. And he's unveiling the desires in a clear language that we can understand. And he's wanting us to search things out. He's, it's, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. He's wanting you to search out things that he's unveiling to you because the more you dig, he's not hiding Easter eggs where you can't find them. He's hiding them based on your level of maturity to discover them. Man, man, I've said it before. I'll say it a hundred more times if I need to. When it, my kids are 10 and 8 now. When they, were, when they wanted to hunt eggs and they were five and three, you know where I hit them? Pretty much where you can see them. I like to, I like to get a little, you know, you know, I like to get a little mischievous sometimes and, and you know, hide one where they're going to have to dig a little bit. Because not everything in life is just going to be something you can see. You're going to have to go after it. Most everything you need in life will be given to you. Most everything you want in life, you're going to have to go get. And so hiding these eggs at that age level, why? If, I was, if my wife was wanting to hunt the eggs, I'm not hiding them in the same places that I hid my children's eggs. Why? Because her maturity level is at a completely different degree. So when the father is saying that I want to play, he loves hide and seek. And he's saying, I'm going to hide this gem, this treasure right here, but I'm going to hide it based on your maturity level because I want you to always be digging and I want you to always be seeking and I want you to always be finding. And the more you grow with him, the deeper that you start to dig to uncover things that are so much even greater than the things he previously showed you, but you had to get to a greater level of maturity so that you could search that thing out. Are you with me? He's not going to hide something where you can't find it that he's wanting you to, to discover now. There are things that you might not discover for five more years from now or 10 more years from now, but your maturity level will increase at that moment where you can dig that diamond out that would have destroyed you in a previous day of maturity. You cannot uncover keys that are going to destroy you in your life because you got an inheritance of authority that you weren't ready to harness yet, but then you reached a level of maturity in sonship that you could then obtain keys that could unlock gates and release things into the earth that wasn't going to destroy you. All right. I'm not going to make it everywhere I wanted to today because I've not even got out of John 16 yet. 
until now, you've not been bold enough to ask, but then you're going to remember, your joy's not going to have any limits. He's uncovering the desires and the authority that you have, all right? Let's, we, we mentioned authority, last. I think it was last week, might have been the week before. When you begin to read the Gospels and you put all the picture together of Jesus' last moments of life on earth in his earthly ministry, and he's in from the Garden of Gethsemane, when you start reading forward from that moment and you begin to get a complete picture of what's happening because they're all pulling out they're all pulling out different details different details of what was happening that night all right and i believe it's mark that was pulling out when he put mark and john together and you begin to see some details of some things that were happening that night and you, and you find and we were pulling this out last week that they came across the kidron valley to capture Jesus, and they sent four to six hundred military people. They sent four to six hundred men to get him. When he got there, he said, "I was daily with you teaching." Or he said it like this: He said, "Who do you seek?" And they said, "Jesus of Nazareth." He said, "I am He." And four to six hundred men fell backward and hit the ground. You go read it. He said, "I am He," and four to six hundred men fell backward and hit the ground. Okay. What do we know? What do we know when he's talking? Man, I'm, I, I, I got to give this. I got to give it. It's, it's too good. Um, in, the, in, the, in the Exodus, Moses said it like this. What if people won't believe me? What shall I tell them? Who shall I tell them sent me? And he said, tell the people that I am sent you. The I am, that I am, that I am, that I am. Are you with me? The I am, that I am. Tell them the I am sent you. I am that I am. All right, Moses goes back and they begin to recognize this, okay? Now watch this, I am. Get over to John chapter number 11. Yes, John chapter number 11, and you find the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Okay, gets there four days. Lazarus has been dead four days. The sister runs out to meet him. Had you been here four days ago, then my brother wouldn't have died. Don't, don't, and, and I've said this, I don't have time to break all this down, but sometimes we're so focused on when, when God didn't show up that we're missing that he's here right now. I'm here right now, lady. And he said, been here four days ago, my brother wouldn't have died. And he said, do you know? And he said, believe and your brother will live again. And she immediately jumps into eschatology because that's what a lot of you know, people, get. well, let's immediately talk about the end times. I know he's going to rise again in the resurrection of the last day. No, 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 no. He said, I am, watch it now, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Now, that, that's a, a unique Greek word, I am, that has like, if you've ever done math and, uh, and you get to those points where you're dividing numbers and you get that, like, you get a repeating number where it just trails off into infinity and instead of writing it into infinity, they put a bar over that thing to say that this thing just keeps going and going, repetitive, repetitive. Uh, the word I am in the Greek is very similar to that where it has, where it, not, not just an accent line, to it, but it's saying that this is this is something when he said I am, it just it goes forever. That I am the resurrection and the life. So then he says later in that moment, he said, Take me to the tomb. And, and or he said, Roll the stone away. He's already been dead four days. His body's gonna start to stink. He said, Roll the stone away. And then he says, He said, We don't hear anything that he that he, he begins to pray the Father. He said, You've already heard my prayer. We didn't hear this prayer. He said, You've already heard my prayer. You've already heard my prayer, but I'm praying it aloud so that those around me may hear it and know that you have sent me. And then he says, Lazarus, come forth. He does not call Lazarus back from the dead in that moment. He, Lazarus is probably alive at this moment. Woman, I am the resurrection and the life. The I am. Why is it a big deal? Because I don't have time to take you there. You can go read it. I believe it's in it, it's towards the end of Mark. I want to say it's like 16, 17, or 18. And then you put John, John, Mark, Luke, Matthew, you start putting them all together, and you're going to find this. When he said, I am he, who do you seek? I am he. They fell backward and hit the ground. Okay? And Mark is the only one that tells this little snippet after they got up. After they got up, what was he saying? Jesus is saying, you're not going to take me by force, but I'm going to lay down my life. 
I was daily with you teaching in the temple. You came out with you like America's most wanted here. You came after me. You came after me like I wasn't daily with you, but you didn't lay a hand on me so that the scriptures must be fulfilled. Who do you seek? I am he. They fall backward and hit the ground. And in Mark, he's the only one that puts this little detail in, which is interesting because he's the shortest gospel. He's one of the kings of brevity and uh, not me, Mark. And so and so, Mark, um, he, he puts this little snippet in there. And he, and he, and, and in, it says that that night, right after that happens, right after this unfolds, it says that there was a, there was a young man there with grave clothes on. It doesn't say grave clothes. It says the Greek of it means grave clothes. Grave clothes. He had a garment on. And it says, they said, what are you doing out here? Because this is in the middle of the night. And they grabbed his clothes and it said he fled from them naked. You guys, I don't know if you caught that detail, but it, it was, it's there in Mark. You can go find it. And we find that those clothes means grave clothes in the Greek. So when he said, I am the resurrection and the life, Lazarus came to life. So why is this young man in, in, in the gospel of Mark running around, running around, he flees from them naked, but why is, what, what's up with this naked guy that's just this interruption in the whole story? Like Jesus is going to the cross and then there's this naked guy. Are you like, like, like where, why, how does this fit? If you know much about the, and I haven't been there, but I, I, I'm aware of it. In the Garden of Gethsemane, across the Kidron Valley, in that moment, right there, where they came to get Jesus, they that this is not something that's discovered, this is something that is known, but in, right near this garden and right near this valley, there is a graveyard that is there that is historic. And when he said, I am he, 600 men hit the ground, 601 got up. I need you to see it. I, I know, because you thought he only had three resurrections, the widow's son at Nain, Jairus' daughter, and Lazarus. No, this is the fourth one, and, and the people aren't talking about it as much. But this young man gets up, and they said, what are you doing here? And they, what's this guy doing here? Wearing them grave clothes. They grabbed, the, they grabbed him, and he left the grave clothes and fled from them naked. Like he just got up in the middle of the night, gets up in the middle of the night right here in this moment, and, and, all, of a, and all of a sudden, like right in the middle of the party here of everything that's happening, why? Because there's authority in the word of God, and when he said, I am he, then this young man came to life. It even says in the scripture that after Jesus rose from the dead, that they saw several other people that had died that had also raised from the dead. I, I think sometimes we just read over this like, 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 it's like, oh, no, no, no. It's a big deal. There was a lot of resurrection happening. And why did I, because when he said, I am, tell, who, who, who should I tell him? Moses, Moses, who should I say sent me? I am that I am. Tell him that. Because I am the everlasting God and it's going on forever. Come on, if you'd been here four days ago, my brother would have lived. No, 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 I am. Let me give you an everlasting word right now so that you don't have to weep over what you thought that you've lost. I am the resurrection and the life. That's why he didn't have to call him back from the dead. He just called him forth because he was already back from the dead. Roll the stone away. There's something that's alive on the inside there. But he still had his grave clothes on. And he said, loose him and let him go. Let him take the grave clothes off of him because he's came back to life in the resurrection of Lazarus. Now we got this night right here with this naked guy. It's an authority of the word of God that knocks these guys flat on their back. You're not going to take me out by force. I'm willingly going to go finish some things that Adam has done. I you to see it. I'm willingly going to lay down my life. It says that when you put all the gospels together and you start putting all the little details there, then you also find this little conversation. At any moment, at any moment, he could have called for 12 legions of angels to come and take him back. I want you to hear it. At any moment, he had 12 legions of angels at his disposal. You know, a legion is how many? 6,000. 6,000. 
So 12 times 6, 72,000. 72,000 angels, come on. If you go over to Ezekiel, you'll find one night where the angel of the Lord came in in one Assyrian camp and killed over 200,000 people in one night. One angel in one night took out, took out over 200,000 people. 72,000 angels. I, I mean, I, I just like... When you start doing that math, you're getting up in this, and you're getting actually more than the current world population right now of their capacity. I'm, I'm sure that that angel probably wasn't even exhausted at 200,000, but I'm just, you know, just, just, for, just, for, just for scale's sake. What's he saying? At any moment, the Christ, the Son of the living God, could call for enough angels out of heaven to not only wipe out the known world now, but everybody that's lived up to this moment. He could take them all out. He could speak the word and do it. You're not taking me by force. I'm willfully going to be crucified so that I can finish something and begin, begin a new day a brand new creation. All right. Oh, I'm going to run out of time. That's all right. Go to Colossians chapter number three, verse number nine. Nope, five. I'm going all the way up there to 10, 11, 12. There it is, five. Colossians three, verse number five. Live as one who has died to every form of sexual sin and purity. Live as one who died to diseases and desires of forbidden things, including the desire of wealth, which is the essence of idol worship. When you live in these vices, you ignite the anger of God against the acts of disobedience. I, I don't have, I, 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 I don't have time, but I do just want to point out this. I just want to point out this because I, I love this that when it's pointing out sexual sin and impurity, live as one who's died to this, it also points out diseases and says live as one who died to this. And the desire for forbidden things, including desire for wealth and the essence of idol worship. Why? Because when you live in these vices, you ignite the anger of God against the acts of disobedience. Boy, how far could we run here? I mean, it's super easy that you're like, hey, friend, you need, like, you got, you got to quit this sexual impurity. That's like, like this, we can, we can talk about these obvious things, but let's talk about diseases showing up in that same list. Live free from diseases. He even goes and says that it can, it can be, oh man, I got I, I to be real careful. But he says that it can, it can cause the anger of God against an act of a disobedience. Does that mean if you're diseased that you're disobedient? I'm going to show you some stuff here. What's already been finished? What's already been finished? You don't have to be sl enslaved to something that's already been completed. No, what? Let's keep going. That's how you once behaved, subject to diseases and sexual impurities and, and desires of wealth, characterized by your evil deeds, but now it's time to eliminate them from your lives once and for all. Anger, fits of rage, all forms of hatred, curse, cursing, filthy speech, and lying. Lay aside your old Adam self with its masquerade and disguise, for you have acquired new creation life, which continually being renewed and which which is continually being renewed into the likeness of the one who created you, giving you the full revelation of God. It is the new creation of life. It is this new creation of life. Your nationality makes no difference or your ethnicity, education, or economic status. They matter nothing. For it is Christ that means everything as he lives in every one of us. Come on, man. All these other things are inferior devices that you don't have to be subject to anymore. It's been finished. Partner 
with the perfect work of what's already been done and come in agreement with what the Father has. Man, go to Matthew 22. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurry. I'm going to hurry, and then I'm just, we'll just preach real good here for a minute. Matthew 22. Very interesting. Verse number one. As was his custom, Jesus continued to teach the people by using allegories. He illustrated the reality of heaven's kingdom realm by saying, there once was a king who arranged an extravagant wedding feast for his son. On the day the festivities were set to begin, he sent his servants to summon all the invited guests, but they chose not to come. So the king sent even more servants to inform the invited guests, saying, come, for the sumptuous feast is now ready. The oxen and fatted calf have been killed, and everything is prepared, so come. Come to the wedding feast for my son and his bride." But the invited guests were not impressed. One was preoccupied with his business. Another went off to to his farming enterprise. And the rest seized the king's messengers and shamefully mistreated them and even killed them. This infuriated the king. So he sent his soldiers to execute those murderers and had their city burned to the ground. Then the king said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, yet those who have been invited to attend did not deserve the honor. Now I want you to go into the streets and alleyways and invite anyone and everyone you find to come enjoy the wedding feast in honor of my son. So the servants went out into the city streets and invited everyone to come to the wedding feast, good and bad alike, until the banquet hall was crammed with people. Now when the king entered the banquet hall, he looked with glee over all his guests, but then he noticed a guest who was not wearing the wedding robe provided for him. So he said, my friend, how is it that you're here and you're not wearing your wedding garment? But the man was speechless. Then the king turned to his servants and said, tie him up and throw him into outer darkness where there'll be great sorrow with weeping and grinding of teeth for everyone is invited to enter in, but few respond in excellence. This doesn't have to be terrifying. Come on. This is the allegory, the metaphor, the parable of the kingdom and a wedding feast. Jesus, are you being a little bit petty that you picked out the one person in the entire crowd that did not have the right clothes on? Don't let this attire fool you, all right? I may look casual, but we didn't come for a casual pursuit. And this young man did not put on the robe that was provided, you see, the, the Jewish wedding, the wedding feast that he's talking about, they have a custom. They have a custom in, in, in certain areas that Jesus is referring to here, especially in that day, that everybody at the wedding dressed exactly alike. Why is it a big deal? Because he was saying there's an everlasting covenant that's being made and everybody wearing the same thing is is saying that we are in agreement with what's happening right now before us. I want you to see it. That we're in agreement so they all, they were provided a wedding garment so it wasn't just something you weren't responsible for going out and buying your own clothes and say, I need to go get me a new dress so that I can go to this wedding. No, 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 no. No, there's going to be a garment provided and it's going to be one that makes you look like everybody else because we're all going to be in agreement with the covenant that's happening right there and it's dressing alike is a uniform of agreement. Now follow it. Now he said, there's been a robe provided for you. So he said, my friend, how is it that you're here not wearing the wedding garment? So it's not just some poor guy that could not afford to put on the wedding garment. There is a robe for you that's been provided and you're not wearing it. Why are you even here? Why are you not in agreement with the wedding feast that's happening right now? And he was speechless. He said, tie him up and throw him out. Every, many are called, few are chosen. If you're reading that translation, this one says, everyone is invited in, but few respond with excellence. Few respond with excellence. 
Sir, all you had to do, it didn't cost you anything to be here. All you had to do was put on what I had already provided for you. And it was a robe. Come on, can I take you to the prodigal son where he provided a robe for the son that's returning home? What was the robe? He was saying that you're coming home as a son, not a slave. He said, he said, the slaves even have more to eat in my father's house than, 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 I, than what I'm going through right here. And he said, go get shoes for his feet. It's significant because slaves went barefoot. And he said, I'm putting shoes on that son's feet. I'm going to give him a ring of acceptance that this is eternal thing. I'm going to put a rope, kill the fatted calf. We're going to celebrate because my lost son, my dead son has now came back to life and he's came home and I'm going to put a robe on him. So this is, this is where you're, this is where you're like, my my, my 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 garments are as filthy rags, but God has provided a righteous robe for you to wear that He tailor made for your life, and He's saying that I'm putting you in the in the unity of this thing so that you can come in agreement with what I've already done for you. You don't have to you don't have to be here out of out of debt. You don't have like this ain't going to cost you anything. All you got to do is come in agreement and put on what I've already given you. Come on. You don't have to go muster up your own righteousness. I'm giving you my righteous robe. I'm imputing everything that's right about God is on the inside of me because he gave me righteousness and I did not strive to obtain it. I didn't pray enough to get it. I couldn't fast enough to earn it. I could not. I could not prophesy enough to get this inheritance. But it was just out of the belief in my heart that he said, I'm giving you something to wear to bring you in agreement with everything that I think about you. If you'll just put on the robe, you'll belong everywhere I say that I'm sending you. You'll belong where I'm bringing you. Just put it on. Just put on in agreement what I'm already doing. I got to hurry. Romans chapter number eight. I'm going to bring it all together. You like connecting dots? Because I do. Romans chapter number eight. Here it is. Verse number 18. Nope. Just kidding. Verse 14. The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of Holy Spirit and you did not receive the spirit of religious duty leading you back into the fear of slavery or never being good enough, but you've received the spirit of full acceptance and folding you into the family of God and you'll never feel orphaned again for as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, beloved father, for the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us and he whispers into our innermost being, you are God's beloved child. Since we are his true children, we qualify to share all his treasures, for indeed we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we're connected in relationship to him, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. We will experience being co-glorified with him, provided that we accept his sufferings as our own provided that we will come into agreement with all with, with what's already been finished, then we will inherit all that he is and all that he has. 18, I am convinced that any suffering we endure is less, is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. The entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. For against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. But now with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom from its slavery to, to decay and to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God, coming to God's children. To this day, we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creation as if it were in the contractions of labor for childbirth, waiting on something to be born. And it's not just creation. We who have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit also inwardly groan as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters, including our physical bodies, to being, trans, being transformed for this is the hope of our salvation. 
But hope means that we must trust and wait for what is still unseen. For why would we need to hope for something we already have? So because our hope is set on what is yet to be seen, we patiently keep on waiting for its fulfillment. And in a similar way, Holy Spirit takes hold of us in our human frailty to empower us in our weakness. For example, at times we don't even know how to pray or know the best things to ask for, but Holy Spirit rises up within us to super intercede on our behalf, pleading to God with emotional sighs too deep for words. God, the searcher of the heart, knows fully our longings, yet he also understands the desires of the Spirit because Holy Spirit passionately pleads before God for us, his holy ones, in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. This is when you're praying, when you're praying, the desires of your heart are becoming fulfilled. When you don't even know what to pray, Holy Spirit begins to intercede, super intercede on your behalf, coming into union with God's plan and destiny for your life. And it begins to unveil thoughts and the intentions of God and how he feels about you and what he's designed for you. Verse 28, so we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives, for we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his design purpose. Now watch it here. For he knew all about us before we were born, and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. This means that the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. Having determined our destiny ahead of time, he called us to himself and transferred his perfect righteousness to everyone he called and those who possess his perfect righteousness he co-glorified with his son. All right, you're caught up on Bible reading for the day. Okay, let's grab this and then we'll go. Okay, let's put this together. Some translation, if you're reading King James in NASB, ESV, it's going to say, for all those he foreknew, he called. For those he called, he, he justified. For those he justified, he glorified. Okay? He's, what, did he, what, did he, what is he doing? That you have been destined to become conformed. What, what's the scripture say about conforming? It says, be ye not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do I renew my mind? That is the Greek word for repentance. It's the changing how you think. Changing how you think is, is, the, is, is a Greek word, metanoia, which means repentance, which means to take another mind. So if I'm renewing my mind, I'm taking the mind of Christ. I hope you can listen fast because I'm talking fast. So so I, I need you to understand this, that when I renew my mind, I'm taking another mind and that mind is the mind of Christ. So now I'm from a different perception that I can think differently than I've ever thought before. So now I need to get to this, that he has destined us. Now hold on just a second because before people run down that road, so I don't have a choice because he said that this is what I'm going to do. No, sir. No, ma'am. You have a choice. You have all been predestined the invitation to come to the wedding feast and the banquet. But you have a choice whether you will put on the garment or not. Come on. Did he not also call Judas to follow him? But what did he say about Judas? When Judas chose his path, he said of Judas, it would have been better for you not to even be born. Come on. I'm, I'm inviting you to follow after me. But you got to be willing to put on the garment. Judas, you're not willing to wear what I've provided for you and you've decided to go down your own path. I need you to see it. I've destined you to become conformed to the image of the Son. That we all, that the firstborn among many brethren is producing, is producing a new creation that look just like him, that have the authority to talk just like him, that have the authority to act like him, that have the authority to do like him, because you're not, are you, are you with me right now? All that he has and all that he is is what we can, or I need you to see it. Oh, yeah, Josh, I don't really know if I like to talk like that. Well, then let's talk about John chapter, uh, let's talk about First John chapter number four, verse number 17. What is that? Might be 17 through 20 there, but he says it like this. All that Christ now is, 
so are we in the all, all that Christ now is. He's not just a man on a cross. He's not just a man in a grave. He's not just a man that's resurrected, but he's also a man that has ascended, ascended to the right hand of the Father. So all that he now is as the Son of God, we are sons and daughters of God, and we have access to all that he is and all that he has. So all of this has already been finished. It's already been completed. And we just need to decide what thing we're going to partner with because we don't have to be enslaved to diseases. We don't have to be enslaved to sins. Sin is a dethroned monarch looking for a place to set. And you need to make up your mind that you're not going to give him any room. If there's ever a time to say there's no room in the inn, it's to the thing that's knocking on your door when Jesus has already filled your heart. And Jesus is even saying, I'll answer your heart story and say, there's no room for you here because I'm occupying this area. Every strategic piece out of me, out of them, out of them will flow rivers of living water. I'm going to release a sound in them. There's no room for other sounds from the enemy because I'm making a sound in them. There's no room for this sickness in their life because I'm saying they're the healed of the Lord. Now let me help somebody. Well, what about all those saints that have died of sickness? Were they in error? Well, they, no, 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 listen, listen. The more revelation you hunger for, the more revelation will be poured on you. There are people in life that decided not to be sick and others had, had, had died in sickness. That doesn't mean that they weren't good people. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that tragedy didn't come. And there's also times where God has us walking through things, but we have to partner with what he said, not what's happening in our body. I'm partnering with him. I'm partnering with him. I'm not going to let disease, it, disease tries to come. I'm going to say, I'm not partnering with you. Well, the doctor said this, that the doctor may have stated facts, but the facts and the truth don't always align. And I'm going to stick with the truth. I am the healed of the Lord. I'm believing for something. Come on, by his stripes, I am healed on earth as it is in heaven in my body. So if you got anything going on in your body that's not going on in heaven, then you can come back into alignment with that. Say, Josh, I don't know how to operate that way. I'm learning too, so join me, won't you? Let's learn together. Let's learn together. I know sometimes there has to be a desperation. There was a, there was a day that I was deer hunting for the glory of God. And, and I was, I was at the time I didn't have my own rifle and it's it just, you, you need your own rifle. Um, I didn't have my own and I was, and I was hunting with my, my mother-in-law had one and, uh, well, they had a, quite a few, but I, I was using my mother-in-law's rifle. Um, I was using a, 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 a bolt action 270 and, uh, my 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 father in law. I guess he had, he had some old, probably reloaded bullets that had I don't know. Apparently, set for some decades. I don't know. And uh, there was a there was a, a a a deer out in the field, and and I I was I was going to I was going to shoot this buck, and I and I was in the stand, and I and I get this thing in my scope and I'm trying to think, okay, he's out there in the middle of that field. How far is that? I'm guessing a little bit here because I, I didn't have a range finder. I didn't even have my own rifle. You don't have your own range finder when you don't have your own rifle. I think he's about 200 yards. I have my own rifle now. I have several rifles. Those guns, they just, they multiply. You just, you put one there and it's like, you know, all of a sudden you got more. Um, and I and I I was like I think he's about two hundred and, and I was trying to get the 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 before I even knew about bullet drop compensation you know you or the terminology for it. you're you're trying to you're trying to to elevate that scope high enough to capture that deer out there and I don't even know if I needed to move it but I, I did I did not get that deer um, and uh, or at least that I know of because at that time I was still learning about this is this has been some time ago and and I would you know most of the time I would go if I 
thought that I, I, let me go check for blood, right? And I go look to the spot where I shot them at. I didn't necessarily go, you know, trailing off hundreds of yards trying to find blood. I just looked at that spot. Well, I don't see any spots, so, I, you know, I didn't get him. I'm not saying I was good at this at this time, okay? And, um, and I, I shot, and when I shot, there was, um, there was like something hit me like in the eye. Like as soon as I shot, I was thinking, oh, my Lord. <laughs> It's like, like, there's this like initial, like, I don't know how, like, did I, and I was like, did I shoot a branch in front of me and catch a ricochet? What is going on? And I was like, I can't believe my eye is like burning. I'm like, what is, what is going on? And, uh, and I was like, my eyes obviously watering at this point. So, you know, I go to look and see if I got the deer and then go back to the truck and, and, uh, I, I then go and, and I get me a water bottle and I just start flushing out that eye and, and I was like, man, it's burning. And, and that was the morning hunt and I, and I could like, I went and tried to go afternoon hunt and it was just like bothering me the whole time. I looked, I didn't shoot myself in the eye. So that was, that was so let's go hunting again. We're all, we're all good. Let's go hunting again. And, uh, but it was bothering me. And I remember that night I went home and I was like, man, what is going on? And what I'd found out is, Um, sometimes an old reload or even just really old bullet, but specifically reloads when, uh, it's, if if maybe they're done properly, not whatever, but, uh, they're in a bolt action and not just a bolt action. It could happen in any, but there was a discharge of powder that recoiled and I ended up with a powder burn, a gunpowder burn on my eye. And I don't know if you've ever had a burn on your eye, but it is very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. I don't know. Has, has there ever been a lady in here drop a curling iron on your eye or something like that? I've seen that. That's that's actually more common than you think. And and they, you know, if you're ever wondering where that lady, why is she wearing that patch like that? She's not. She's not a big fan of Pirates of the Caribbean. She she probably dropped the you know she probably dropped the curling iron on her eye, and um, and so. The burn. It's just like like there's like sandpaper rubbing my eye, and every time you close it. And I could, obviously I could not sleep that night. It was it was frustrating to me. And so it was probably around three a.m. or so. I just got up and I said, "Father, I, I started praying. I don't know what's going." I was like, "This is," and I'm discovering these things later in hindsight. But I was like, "I don't know what's going on with my eye." I said, "This is this is bothering me. It's hindering me." I, I was like, "This is," and I, I prayed. I prayed for like two hours, <clears throat> and at five a.m. it just stopped, and I just went on about my business. So it was a burn on my eye that healed in less than 24 hours. Because sometimes you just have to go after him until you see what you're hoping for. And I know that's something that happened in my life, but what are you hoping for in yours? And sometimes to get a hold of God in a specific degree there has to be enough things that are hindering you. It's like, I'm not, listen, you're not supposed to be robbed of your sleep. What's robbing you of your sleep? Take it to prayer. And when I say take it to prayer, I'm not telling you to text seven friends so that you can get their opinions and say that you took it to prayer. Take it to prayer and give it to God and trust him. Now, he may say, I've got, I've got a friend of mine that God told him, I'm going to walk you. I'm, you're going to have to walk this healing out. God told him that. He had to walk the healing out. But God still healed him. So how, there might be an instantaneous miracle. Might be something that you have to walk out. But trust that it's already been finished. And you need to partner with that over and over. How often do you need to renew your mind? Right? Daily. That's what the scripture says. Daily. Daily. So how often do I need to partner with God's thoughts and take his mind about what's happening in my life? Daily. Hey, stand with me. I don't know if I preached an hour and a half yet, but it's, you know, it's close enough. So Sherry, Sherry knows. Sherry knows. It's close enough. Daily, man. Going after him in absolute pursuit with that partnership and coming in the humility of God's thoughts. 
Humility is partnering with God's thoughts for your life. Not your, you've got, some of you need to break agreement with your own thoughts about your life. Because you see yourself not how God sees you. You're seeing yourself through the lens that is not, that is not correct. And you need to inherit a new perspective to start speaking over your marriage, over your business, over your children, over your own life how God views it. Well, I don't know what he says. Then ask him. I mean, if you want to, we we can pray together and we can prophesy over you. You can also ask him. He's not trying to hide his desires from you. He's 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 not withdrawn from you. He's inviting you in. Will you wear the robe and stand there and come in agreement with what he has to say, with what he thinks about you? Let's pray. Father, you do such cool things among us. And I thank you for it. God, thank you for a people that's willing to sit here long enough and receive seeds. That they just steward those in their greenhouses. God, sometimes I preach so long and they just sit there. They just sit there and and enjoy it. I know it. Lord, I thank you. I thank you, God, for them receiving seeds that are going to explode into harvest in their life. I thank you, Father, for revealing and unveiling your thoughts about them. Your thoughts about them. God, we want to partner with you. We want to partner with you. We want to walk in the authority of your word that, that has resurrection power in it, that has authority to cause enemies to fall backward and hit the ground. God, we want to partner with that. That we, that we become true sons and daughters of God. That we don't just talk about it, but we walk out in life what you've worked out from us or for us. So, Father, thank you that we don't have to, that we don't have to strive and try to earn this or work it out. Lord, thank you, God, that we don't need work boots to walk with you. It doesn't mean there's not work that we don't have to go to work, but we need walking shoes because we just need to walk out what you've worked out because you've already worked it out. Father, I thank you for doing that. I thank you, God, for doing that. I speak blessing over them. I speak favor over them. Lord, we call forth promotion in them, whether it's on the job they got or you promote them to another job. I thank you, God, for that happening. Uh, Father, yeah, I, Lord, I thank you for that happening even this week for somebody that you just bring that you just bring promotion that you just bring promotion, God, and Lord, I just I just thank you for it. Whatever, maybe, you know, Lord, whatever, whatever that 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 means, God, I just thank you, Lord, for 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 what you're what you're lining up. Somebody's been you've been you've been praying about some things, and the Lord's the Lord's aligning some stuff. So, Father, I just I thank you, God, that some things are coming into fruition. And it's not just something for the for the way down the road, but God, something even even now in the near future, some things are coming into fruition, Father, for somebody. And I, th- I thank you, God, for that. You you're encouraging now, now, and confirming in them now that you've heard their prayer and that you're shifting some things. You're shifting some things on their behalf. You're working for them, Father. I thank you for it. So let us be confident and let us be full of trust because everything you pray hits the intended mark. Everything that you've built stands forever. So, Father, thank you for that. We partner with you. We thank you for it. We give you glory. Amen. See?